I'm glad you could join us today for the virtual dimension of the teaching ministry here at Living Springs. And we're going to continue our study through 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you want to open there with us, okay? That's our text today in our Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, okay? And um, kind of lead into this. When we consider what the Lord accomplished in and through the lives of those first apostles of Christ, those guys, and really, you know, the first century church, birthed, birthed fresh in the life, love, and the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but, you know, and I read the book of Acts, and I read the things in the epistles, the things that really hits me anyway is, you know, wow, how did all the incredible stuff happen? And why isn't God doing that in the church today? I mean, doesn't the Bible assure us that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Well, you know, that's why we've been left with the, oh, well, really here, the New Testament, should I say. And the neat thing about 2 Corinthians is, it kind of comes off to me as a conversation with Paul where he shares personal insights and principles that, you know, he and the other apostles of Christ knew and understood and, and they lived by that really proved to be essential, practical, but necessary keys to living the kind of spirit-empowered testimony for Jesus Christ that, you know, has become the hallmark and the legacy of the early church. Birthed, like I said, fresh in the life of love and the power of the Holy Spirit. So... Today, we're going to work our way on in two verses 9 through 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But first, let's get ourselves primed, okay, for what the Word of God in our text today would speak to our hearts and minds. You know, in the first verses of 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, we're told that the Word of God, when faithfully proclaimed, consistently does three things, if you recall it. It confronts, it corrects. And number three, it exhorts to take action accordingly. In other words, the Word of God, it, it persuades, which I think is a lot of what the Spirit did among the people through the selflessly yielded lives of Paul and the other apostles. In fact, you're going to hear him talk about that as we get into our text today in chapter 5. But, you know, with that, I'm going to lead on into our study today with, as I often do, a question. Call it a pretest for our text today, if you will, okay? So that, you know, maybe you can see for yourself the incredible relevance of what we're going to get into. You ready? Here it comes. How much of your thoughts and affairs through the course of your daily life are influenced by an awesome awareness and regard for the Lord's presence and purpose? It's something the scripture refers to as the fear of the Lord, or as you'll hear Paul call it, the terror of the Lord. I mean, really, what's the big deal, some might ask. I mean, well, for starters, how about this? Looking out on this present world, the mankind is created for himself in disregard for and apart from God. The Lord issues this rather frank assessment, and yeah, he does that. And it's recorded for us in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, where the Lord says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Now, I'm certain in the world, among those who are lost, there's probably millions who would beg vigorously to differ in regard to that rather frank assessment, the fact that, as God sees, there is none who does good, no, not one. I can hear them clamoring to justify themselves, you know, on the basis of all the things men have done or accomplished, which, you know, they in the world view as being good and to man's credit. So what's the problem here? Well, you know, from the standpoint of what God sees and discerns, and yeah, he sees and discerns everything. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, God himself declares, he said, I am the Lord, 
search the, I search the heart, I test the mind, and even to give every, every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. So getting back to that business of God's assessment there in Romans, when you drop down through all the myths that's described, and, and you come to verse 18, Romans chapter 3, verse 18, God reveals really the root of the problem. He says, there is none that does good. No, not one. Because <clears throat> he straight up declares that. He says, there's no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, in terms of everything that they think and say and do, everything that they judge is so good and wonderful and that, you know, man deserves all this credit. There's absolutely no regard for not even a shred of thought given to either God or his purpose. Not in any of it. And yeah, that typically includes a lot of the religious stuff that goes on in the world as well, which, you know, Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7, Jesus issued this stinging indictment of the religious leaders of his day. When he said, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. So it's not just enough to wear a frock. They, they're all decorated. They're all de decked out. and They're all fancy with bright. And, I mean, they stand out among people. There they are. And it goes on to say, and they love the best places at feasts, the, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. They're really into the titles and the position and all of that, the status. Which, you know, I ought to give you a pretty good sense of where our text is leading us today. In the previous verses leading up, okay, if you recall, Paul talked about the confidence that sustained he and the other apostles in spite of the fact, as he said in chapter 4, we are, we are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, all on account of the fact that their hearts and lives are focused on the yet-to-be-realized purpose and the promise of God, knowing, as Paul so boldly informs all true believers in the 14th verse there in the fourth chapter, that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So he's talking about the promise and the certainty of a future resurrection for those who are born of the Spirit, children of God in Christ Jesus, which he explained, if you recall, in greater detail going on into chapter 5. You could see it in your Bible there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, For we know, we know, that if our earthly house, this tent, talking about this body we currently inhabit here in the, in the here and now, is destroyed, he said, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. I mean, you talk about a totally whole new, eternally incorruptible, glorious physical body, designed and fitted solely for life and the eternal perfection that God has always purposed for those who are His in Jesus Christ. Now, that seems way too fantastic even to begin to get a handle on, let alone having our hearts and lives set on such an unseen hope so as to live in the pursuit of it. Kind of causes you to understand kind of what Jesus was getting at when He revealed another fantastic but essential truth in John chapter 3, verse 3. Well, he said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again, talking about that eternally transformational thing, for lack of a better word, that takes place within when a true believer responds to the gospel in faith and then makes a life-changing choice as a result to repent and in other words, turn from themselves and all else to unconditionally and forever commit their lives, their hope, and their destiny to Jesus instead. At which point, a whole wonderful new life, direction, and destiny is, is birthed within the believer 
As Jesus went on to explain in John chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, when he said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit cannot enter the kingdom of God. Because that which is born of the flesh, this right now that we live in, is, is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. It's a difference. So Jesus wanted to say, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. That was his explanation. And it gives real meaning, I think, to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, when he said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you birth within you. And that's how it is. See, though you can't see it with your eyes right now, if you are truly a born of the Spirit child of God in Jesus Christ, you know it's for real. The whole enchilada, a resurrection body and all, on account of the fact that it has been birthed within your heart by His Spirit who is given to us. As we heard, and you see it there in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 5, where Paul says that now he who, who, he who has prepared us for this very thing, this destiny, this promised resurrection, he who has prepared us even now for this very thing is God who has also given us the Spirit as a guarantee. I mean, that's it. It's all about being born of the Spirit, and with the assurance and guarantee of God's Spirit within. You recall, Paul continued on through verses 6 through 8, what he said. And so we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, right now we're absent from the Lord. So as a result, he says, for we walk by faith and not sight. But he says we are confident, yes, well pleased. In other words, what we really prefer and look forward to, he said, is to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord, to be, leave this old body behind and to be raised up in our new body to be with the Lord. And that's right, you know, we can have confidence that is unshakable in the face of whatever the struggles, the issues, and the challenges that you know, we who live to serve for the testimony of Christ and have to deal with even in the course of the life in the here and now. In fact, the promise, the hope, literally becomes something that those who have the Spirit within them long for. More and more, in fact, as that day draws near, as Romans 8, 23, verse 8, chapter, chapter 8, verses 23 through 25 reveals that it says, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. That's what it's all about, being saved in this hope for that. He goes on to say, but hope that is seen, you're going to see it in here and now. Why are we living for the stuff in here and now? He says, for why does one still hope for what he sees? That doesn't even make sense, does it? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Perseverance, it's a word which is defined as enduring patience. Talking about patience, you know, that never loses its hope or its focus in spite of what Ever this present life confronts us with. Always, always constantly aware that, you know, at any moment it could happen. That blessed hope foretold in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17, when we read the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, if we're here when it happens, okay, and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And it is talking about the physical resurrection of all who are in Christ, our resurrection 
at the rapture. That moment that takes place will set into motion that terrible seven-year global apocalypse down here described in Matthew chapter 24 and also through much of the book of Revelation, chapters 4 all the way through the beginning of chapter 19, all of which culminates in Jesus' second coming. Giving cause. You know, for anyone I think who will listen, I'm talking to anyone who will listen, to seriously consider this warning given by Jesus in Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36. Jesus said, but take heed to yourselves. Don't worry about the person next to you. Take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life and that day come on you expectedly. In other words, you miss it. You're not ready. For Jesus said, it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So watch, therefore, and pray always, Jesus said, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass, those terrible things during that seven-year period, and to stand before the Son of Man, to be caught away, resurrected with the saints at the time of the rapture, to be with the Lord. So I ask you at this point, has God got your attention? Man, I hope so. And if so, are you beginning to have a sense of awe regarding the Lord that makes you now stop and think about what it is that he's saying? That's something we refer to as the fear of the Lord. And if that's the case, then I say good. That's great. Because now you're ready for verses 9 through 11 in our text today. Because if you notice, 9 begins with therefore. Okay, So it connects to all that stuff we were just talking about. Where we see now, or going to see how the confidence of the Holy Spirit within literally gives rise to another incredible dimension of the life you and I have been saved in Christ to live in service for his testimony. Something that, that I refer to as the awe factor. No, not the awe factor. I mean the awe factor. As you're about to see, Paul and the other apostles were totally taken with it. Check it out. Let's look at verse 9. There you go. There's the connecting word. Therefore, he said, we make it our aim. Okay. So therefore, in other words, Paul reveals that it's really this is now he's talking about now as a result of this knowledge, this assurance and confidence that they have in the certainty of the resurrection because of the spirit who's been given to live within him. He says, therefore, we make it our aim. In other words, this is our, this is our only objective or reward, if you will, in all this business of living to serve for the testimony of Christ. Being, as Paul puts it, to be well-pleasing to him. Totally pleasing to him, that being God, as opposed to either their own ambitions or agendas or impressing others or catering to the desires and the expectations of men, obtaining status and position and titles or enriching themselves and acquiring worldly possessions. And I mean, I could go on and on, all the fleshly stuff. And I think this is important because, you know, when you think about the fact that they were pressed upon on every side, that they were, they were perplexed at times, that they were, they were cast down, they were persecuted. You know, you may look at those guys and say, you know, really, this whole business of, of going around and persuading men, what's in it for you? Well, of course, they had their eyes on the resurrection. But it's like, what's in it for you? What is it guys are after here, like, like right now? Well, you know, this is what he says. Paul puts it. He says, you know, to be pleasing to him. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. That's all. I mean, and what we're seeing in Paul and the others is this incredible sense of awe and regard for the Lord above all else, such that it thoroughly captivated their awareness in life. It was the one thing that, 
You know, it's like, we just want to please him. And it did, it exerted an incredible influence over everything they said and did. That was what they were after because as Paul explains in verse 10, you see it there. He says, look, we must all, we must all, and he's talking about believers now, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one, each one of us, may receive the things done in the body. That's right here and now in this body. According to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now that word appear means to be manifested or exposed. And I think maybe the best rendering would be revealed. Revealed before the judgment seat of Christ. You know, the picture I think of often is from the old classic movie, The Wizard of Oz. At the end, when Dorothy finally made it to the Emerald City and into the, into the castle of the great wizard, and the one that you know she knew was the only one who could uh, get her back to Kansas, and you know she and Toto and the others that were with her there, they walked into this hall, and suddenly they were terrified by this whole terrible image of the wizard up there on the wall. And with this booming, terrible voice and flashing lights and, and smoke and everything, you know, they were, they just shrank back. And it was terrible. And then <laughs> Toto, the little dog, off to the side, he runs over and he, he grabs the, a curtain. He pulls it back and out of the corner of her eye. Dorothy sees, and then she looks over, and she realizes there's this little man behind the curtain with the cameras and pulling levers and stuff and talking into a microphone. And all I could say is busted, okay? <laughs> busted. And, you know, the thing is, is that he was revealed. He, he was exposed. The truth of who was really doing that was exposed. And you see, and that's really what it is when we stand before Jesus one day. Regardless of what it is we've made ourselves out to be or convinced others that we are, well, everything we've done, for good or for bad, it's going to be exposed for what it is. And, and we're talking about the children of God in Christ here now. You, me, Paul's saying himself and the other apostles included all who are saved, so that our deepest motives resulting in, in the things that we thought and said and did will be revealed for what they were, really, either, either good or bad. For as Hebrews 4.13 tells us, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. I mean, think about it. What is it that we're really after anyway? Rewards from the hands of men that afford us some measure of fleeting glory in this life? Or rewards from the hand of our Savior that will stand forever to the praise of His glory and grace forever? For example, you know, Jesus said this to His followers. He said this to His followers. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, he said, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men. Now, charitable deeds, would, all would agree, would be good. They, they would look good anyways. A good thing to do, do for, you know, to help other people. So he says, take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. There you go. Otherwise, Jesus says, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, here's the way it's supposed to go. When you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you. Hey, look at me. Hey, everybody. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. That's their reward. And it's true, you know, religious acts, spiritual things that appear outwardly good, spiritual, 
impressive, even of God. Done by, oh, surely a man or a woman of God. <laughs> man, they can be easily employed as a misleading disguise for selfish intentions. For example, that word hypocrite that Jesus used there comes from the Greek word hypocrites, referring to an actor in the Greek theater who wears a mask that covers his true identity. Taking on the appearance, he wants the people to see someone else on that stage other than the one that, uh, who he really is. So, yeah. The point is, is that you think Jesus is making a point that such intentional public displays of righteous acts, in God's eyes, regardless of what we think about them or other people, in God's eyes anyway, are nothing more than that, an act. A show, a production. See, notice these guys Jesus uses as an example here. They're not giving to give out of the generosity of a pure selfless regard and love for God or others. No, they're, they're giving to get rewards from others that advance their own status and position, reinforcing their own sense of self-righteousness. And being as that is basically all they're really after. Jesus says, you know, well, that's their reward. The fleeting glory and self-satisfaction in the here and now. So yeah, you know, <laughs> we can impress others and even ourselves. The thing is, that racket doesn't work with Jesus. It doesn't work on Jesus. There will be a day coming when just his presence will expose and reveal everyone and everything from the deepest motives of our heart to the thoughts and the deeds that came about as a result for what they really are. And you know, it's all going to come off something like this. We're shown in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 11 through 15, where it says, For no other foundation can anyone lay that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So that is our salvation, a foundation that is unmovable. So, you know, being on, in Christ and our lives and our faith established upon Christ Hey, that's it, man. Nothing's going to change that, okay? The thing is, is that what will we do now with all that grace that God pours into our lives or wants to pour into our lives as a result of our salvation? Well, the point being, there's something called accountability because, yeah, though God always has had a purpose for our lives. The Bible tells us, I think it is in Ephesians chapter Chapter 2 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he before ordained that we should walk in them. I mean, even from the foundations of the world. So though God has, like I said, always had a purpose for us, a design. Hey, we still possess the will to choose. So we continue. Okay, it goes on to say, Now if anyone builds on this foundation... The foundation of our salvation in Christ builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. He goes on to say each one's work will become clear for the day, the day we stand before Jesus. We'll declare it, meaning it will be openly exposed for what it really is because it will be revealed by faith. Fire, and fire will test, in other words, prove each one's work of what sort it is. Whether it's gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, okay? So it goes on to tell, it says, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, that's the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, because when you put the fire to them, they, they endure, they, they stay, they don't burn up. Okay, it says he will receive a reward. And that's what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. It's about giving out rewards to his people. On the other hand, 
If anyone's work is burned, that being, well, let me see, the wood, the hay, and I um, can't th think of what it was. Anyway, it says he will suffer loss. It'll be burned, burned up. <laughs> but he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. I mean, the whole thing about being saved through fire, you think about that. Everyone else in heaven and glory is going to have these wonderful things to show for the testimony of, of the grace and the goodness of God in their lives and the things that they freely and selflessly allowed God to work in and through their lives for the glory of Christ. You want to walk around with wood, hay, and, 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 and straw? <laughs> the things that you, I mean, the works of the flesh, I mean, you see, that's the thing. They burned up, it's like, Oh, man, you know when you're standing before Jesus, you're going to want to get rid of those things anyway. At that point, they're, they're not going to look so good, are they? It's going to, so you, yeah, and you're going to be saved. So, you know, works that are the result of what we lovingly allow the Holy Spirit to bring about in and through our selflessly yielded lives to what He wills so as to please Him. They're likened here to gold, silver, and precious stones, okay? And... When torched, they survive. They will stand forever to the praise and the glory of what we allowed the Lord to work in and through our lives. On the other hand, the works that we produced, you know, that's, all, that's such, a, such a thing in this life, isn't it? It's like, hey, look what I did. Hey, look at me. You know, the works that we produced in the pursuit of selfish motives and ambitions, the stuff of the flesh that is likened here to wood, hay, and straw, you know, regardless of how outwardly impressive and good they may have looked to ourselves and to people here and now, when proven and exposed by fire in the day we stand before Jesus, man, they're going to they're going to be gone. And you know, if that's mostly what our lives as believers really lived in the pursuit of, you know, too bad but we'll still be saved because we're on the foundation. We will still be saved so as to stand ourselves forever to the praise of His grace. But we will have little else to show for the glory of all that the Lord has wanted to pour into our lives through His Spirit as a result of His salvation. But you know, again, you know when it comes to those who are born of the Spirit, children of God in Jesus Christ, I find being lovingly, selflessly, and unconditionally yielded to the Spirit's present and leading within, tends to instill within such a believer an incredible sense of awe and regard for the person and the purpose of God. Yeah, you got it. The fear or the terror of the Lord. And we hear Paul talk about it here, because look at verse 11. Because he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Knowing, therefore, being cognizant of or always aware of the terror of the Lord, that being held in awe of and in regard for the Lord and seeing themselves as accountable to Him alone and wanting to please Him, with that ever before them, Paul tells us, that's why we persuade men. That's why we do it. That's what's in it for us. In spite of everything we have to deal with in this life, right now in the here and now, you want to know what we get out of it. What's in it for us? We just want to please God. We know, therefore, we're held in awe of the Lord. We just want to please Him. It's because of that we persuade men. You know, and, and regardless of whether or not anyone acknowledged the sincere and the selfless motives behind their preaching as an example for their own conscience, you know, to adopt and follow. Because he goes on to say here in verse 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we're well known to God. He understands the accountability factor here. And I also, he says, trust are well known in your conscience. But I trust whether or not we are. Okay, I think we are, but you know, it's still, we're after pleasing the Lord because we are held in awe of Him. You see, still that sense of awe of and regard for the Lord 
that kept them always and ever faithful to him alone as they lived to serve for the testimony of Christ as faithful, selfless stewards of the boundless grace that God poured into their lives through his spirit who lived within them. Never giving a second thought, really, as to how any of it might be used to advance their own agenda or position among the people they served, or to cater to the expectations and the desires of men, which, again, I believe further explains, really, the incredible things that the Lord accomplished in and through their selflessly yielded lives. And it's true. It's true. God never changes. He's the same yesterday and forever. But the thing is, maybe we need to. Maybe we need to stop more often and, and ask ourselves, well, what is it that I'm really after? And when, especially when it comes to righteous works, religious works, things that look good to us and look good to other people, you know, even doing good things, things that will help people. Serving in ministry, whatever it might be, in the local body, in the fellowship, and serving people outside the church. We need to ask ourselves, why am I doing it? Is it for me? Is it for them? Or is it for Jesus? I think it's important for us, all of us really, if we want to see the Lord really move in the church the way that he did in the first century, that we cop a whole new attitude and perspective toward the Lord, something you might call the fear or awe factor.